Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here. Um, I do love Ottawa, and I think it's my fifth time in Ottawa, and I'm especially excited to have been invited to participate in this weekend with you. Well, is the Bible a myth? This is a fascinating and controversial question. I'm sure we all have opinions. This big question has at least three answers. Do they all have equal merit? Is one a better answer? Let's look at them. Three answers. The first answer, yes, the Bible, or much of it, is a myth. It's not true. Two, second answer, no, the Bible is not a myth. It is true. Third answer, yes, the Bible is a myth, and it is true. This last group is either very confused, <laughs> or they're onto something. Answer number one, the Bible is a myth, it's not true. This group of people sees the world through the lens of scientific naturalism or materialism, they assume the supernatural does not exist. They assume that everything has a natural explanation. Creation stories predate scientific understanding. We know better now. And God, if he does exist, cannot intervene in human history. All thinking modern people understand this, they say. For example, Rudolf Bultmann, who was also cited earlier this evening, the German theologian and professor of the New Testament, in his book, Jesus Christ and Mythology, said, modern science does not believe that the course of nature can be interrupted or, so to speak, perforated by natural, supernatural powers. For modern man, the mythological conception of the world, the conceptions of eschatology, of redeemer and redemption are over and done with. The Bible shares imagery with the pagan myths. We can point to the return of Persephone, the goddess of spring and summer, corn, who dies every winter and is reborn every spring. She's a resurrection image. Here, this image of uh, Persephone being greeted by Mother Demeter uh, with every, every spring, a, a resurrection image. Or the god Dionysus, Bacchus, god of the vine, the joyous cheer of wine, or, of course, mad drunkenness. He's the tragic god who dies and returns to life, and he's also considered to be the primary image for belief in immortality. The Gospels contain pagan imagery. The pagans imagined the incarnation, God, with a divine father and a human mother, and pagans imagined that after the tragic death of a god came the resurrection. These are not new concepts. So thinkers like Boltman say, let's demythologize the Bible. Let's separate fact from fiction. Let's separate the historical Jesus from the fictitious stories of the supernatural. This rests on the assumption that all miracles are fiction, like the pagan dying God and resurrection stories. A contemporary uh, representative of this kind of thinking, Derek Murphy, authored this book, Jesus, Potter, Harry, Christ. <laughs> yeah, really, it's true. Um, it's the, it, this book is the 2011 winner of the best religious nonfiction. It's always good to know what people are reading or what people are told they should be reading. Uh, now, Murphy, like uh, Bolton, Boltman, 
has the same thesis that because there are similarities, it is fiction. We might think, really? I don't think you're going to make it in law school. Perhaps that's rude of me to say that. Uh, but yes, so that, that, is, that is the thesis. So the idea that, let's look, the, cost, the gospel accounts, the Greek myths, Harry Potter, they're all just story. And yeah, they're, they're all just story because, well, the reason is uh, they are, they share similar, uh, even the same motifs, ancient motifs, all the same stuff. So some people say that this is a genuine argument which Christian apologists have no answers to. Others say, well, it is blasphemy, and besides that, we do have several answers. Um, Perhaps some of us would like to answer such skeptics by quoting Hamlet, who said to his friend, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. However, C.S. Lewis was really quite sympathetic to naturalists. He ought to have been, he was once one, C.S. Lewis thought it was very difficult for all moderns, whether Christian or not, all of us. Uh, it's very hard for us to shed naturalist assumptions. In his book, Miracles, he wrote, we all have naturalism in our bones, and even conversion does not at once work the infection out of our system. Its assumptions rush back upon the mind the moment vigilance is relaxed. Let's turn to answer two. No, uh, the Bible is not a myth, it's true. Everything happened just as the Bible says it happened. This group of people sees the world through the lens of biblical authority. The Bible is the word of God, it is not a man-made myth. You can find it all on the map of Israel. The events recorded took place in space-time history. Historical documents support this. Archaeological evidence proves it. These people believe that God is the God of miracles who has the power to not only create the universe, but also to enter human history. The pagan myths, on the other hand, make no historical claim. That would be a big difference. The historical nature of the Bible does not read like a myth. As Lewis said, I was too experienced in literary criticism to regard the Gospels as myths. Essentially, he was saying, these people should go back to school and study literature. Then we could talk. Now, so far, the second group, um, they sound like every other Orthodox Christian. But they do have one distinction. For them, mythic literature is, all, is taboo because they regard pagan myths to be evil. In fact, they reject all mythic and fantasy literature as evil, including the works of Christians like Lewis and Tolkien. They ask, why then do Christian writers like Lewis mix pagan imagery with Christian motifs? Fawns, magicians, the god Bacchus, that's evil. For example, in Narnia, Lewis, that great Christian saint, Lewis has the Prince Caspian dancing with the fawns. These people say, these stories should be shunned by all Christians. And for this, they are ridiculed as ignorant by many. Can't they understand literature? What's wrong with these people? Don't they read? They only read the Bible, that's not literature. It's like, okay, I think you all should go back to school. Um, 
In their defense, I believe these Christians are justly worried about some fantasy literature. Much of it is dark. In my opinion, they are also justly worried about neo-paganism and witchcraft. That said, both groups, one and two, have more in common than they might think. Both assume that myths, by definition, are untrue. Both, therefore, fail to understand what myth means. Both reject answer number three. Yes, the Bible is a myth, and it is true. Define myth. What is a myth? Well, let's look at the Greek. Mutos, myth, means word or speech. The verb, mutologio, means to relate word for word, to give an account through story. Myth. This is kind of a bare bones definition that I, I think I use all the time. Myth, we might say, is a sacred story. We might say it's a cultural story if we don't think there is such a thing as a sacred story, but it's somehow a very important story within a culture which may or may not be historically true. For example, the American dream of prosperity is a myth. It's true for some people, and it's so not true for others. Another contemporary myth, the Canadian myth of tolerance. I can say this because I'm Canadian. Um, how tolerant are we really when we disagree? Here's what Lewis said about the Bible being a myth. If ever a myth had become fact, it would be just like this. Nothing else in all literature was just like this. Myths were like it in one way, histories were like it in another, but nothing was simply like it. And no person was like the person it depicted. As real, as recognizable, not a god, but God. Here, and here only, in all time, the myth must have become fact. The word, flesh. God, man. Similarly, Lewis famously said, the heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. By becoming fact, it does not cease to be myth. That is the miracle. The marriage of heaven and earth, perfect myth and perfect fact. Should we be nervous about pagan Christs? No, we shouldn't be. Lewis said, we must not be nervous about parallels and pagan Christs. They ought to be there would be a stumbling block if they weren't. Lewis thought that God sent humanity pictures of truth. And perhaps we ought to think about this in terms of God sending um, pagan humanity, uh, not the original chosen people, but the rest of us, pictures of truth of the dying and rising God. However, we have distorted these pictures. They awakened our imaginative desire for eternity. And that is why Lewis so freely put Bacchus and Salinas in Narnia. When Aslan returns, the pagan gods help to grasp the great joy the pagan longing for joy, aided by alcohol, so dangerous outside of Christ, is redeemed when the true God of the vine, Aslan as the Christ figure, is revealed. As Susan says, 
as they are watching Bacchus and Salinas and the wild girls, she says, I wouldn't have felt safe with Bacchus and all his wild girls if we'd met them without Aslan. Lucy answers, I should think not. In Lewis's view, because the ideas of the dying and rising God and the great celebration are familiar, humanity is better able to grasp when it actually happened. Jesus breaking bread at Emmaus after the resurrection. The God of wine and corn has come to earth. Does it matter that the Bible is true myth? The Hebrew psalmist writes of God as telling us to listen as he speaks to us in parables and explains mysteries from days of old. That's Psalm 78, verse two. And Jesus, as we know, preferred to speak in parables, to tell stories. The in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, we hear uh, the disciples ask, well, why do you tell stories? And Jesus answered, I tell stories to create readiness, to nudge the people toward receptive insight. Here's why this matters. Mere descri descriptions of God, if that's what we have, that's looking at God from the outside. That can lead to idolatry. The Bible, God's story, invites us inside. to experience him and to have relationship with him. Matthew Dickerson and David O'Hara have put it this way regarding that distinction. Description, just describe God, that leads to idolatry. Story that invites us inside. They say this. There is a risk that if religion is only theological propositions, a series of affirmations about God, then it becomes an idol. It does not grow, it can only decay. But from start to finish, the Bible is full of stories. It is one grand narrative composed of hundreds of small narratives. The Bible is not so much concerned with defining God as with describing God and telling a story. The aim of the story is not to capture God, the idea that, aha, I now control God. No, no, the, the aim of the story is not to capture God, but to point to God and to invite the reader to engage in the adventure of seeking God. The Bible, true myth and true fact, is a story that invites us to discover God. That's why the Bible as true myth matters. The Bible invites us inside the greatest story ever told. In a sense, we really ought to say the only story so that we can discover God. Thank you. <laughs>